Hi, and welcome to this month's workshop on gaslighting. I'm going to start the workshop by first talking about um, what gaslighting actually is and giving you some definitions. But stick with us because deeper into the workshop, we're going to unpack ways that you can respond to stop it in its tracks. And then we went ahead and stayed over um, on this workshop to handle a lot of questions and answers. And we can always glean so much from other people's questions. So stay tuned and thank you for joining us. Gaslighting is a common, rather loosely used term in our culture today. We're hearing more and more about it. And most of us are familiar with gaslighting as a hidden or covert form of emotional abuse. But what exactly is gaslighting? Gaslighting is one of the most common forms of domestic abuse and psychological manipulation by which the abuser attempts to make the victim question their own perception, memories, or even their mental health. And gaslighting causes significant self-doubt and confusion within the victim. There's nothing accidental about abusive gaslighting. It's actually very intentional. Um, it doesn't mean that the abuser is always conscious. It's just uh, of what they're doing. Um, it may be subconscious because it's habitual um, and they automatically go to um, trying to confuse you as a defense, but uh, they don't necessarily do this with other people in their lives. It's mostly focused on interpersonal relationships. So I just want you to know it is intentional and it's important to know that. The abuser's intentionality uses gaslighting to mask their faults and increase the victim's dependence on the abuser. So what do I mean about dependence on the abuser? The victim actually has deep feelings that they cannot trust themselves because of how many times they've been gaslit and caused to um, wonder if their perception was accurate or not. So they rely on the gaslight lighter to clarify events and conversation, which is a form of dependence. Gaslighting involves the abuser playing mind games with the victim through various means like lying, rewriting history, uh, trickery, and other forms of deception designed to make the victim question their own reality and even sanity. By promoting a false narrative, the abuser, the abuser convinces their partner that they are remembering things wrong or misinterpreting events, which leads the victim to adopt the abuser's desired reality, um, the, the abuser's impressions, thoughts, and feelings over the victim's feelings. And while the victim struggles to resolve the confusion, the abuser acts as if they have no idea what the victim is talking about. And they may even add what appears to be a genuine concern about the victim's mental well-being to make it even more insidious and confusing. So before we um, go on, I wanted to ask you a question, if you feel comfortable. I'd love it if you would share with us in the chat ways that you feel you have been gaslit in the past that really impacted you. Or maybe you're wondering if you are in a relationship where you're currently being gaslit and you're trying to make sense of things to figure out what's actually happening. If you've identified the experience of being gaslit, maybe it's been so pervasive that you feel like you have to journal what actually took place in a conversation or in an argument to prove what your partner actually said to you. Um, because of how they will gaslight you and say, I never said that or rewrite history. So I'd love it if you would share your experiences in the chat. You can just do a short example of gaslighting or you can be more descriptive if you'd like to. Um, and then I'm gonna ask Jill to share them anonymously, anonymously with me so that we can all know that no one is alone. It just lets us all know that We've experienced this and it's hard and we're here with each other. Yeah. Do we have any comments, Jill? We do. We do. We have a, we have a handful. Um, 
the first says, he will say, I never said that sometimes right, right after he said it, it's crazy making. Um, the next one says, always being told, I never told them something like an event or plans coming up. Um, saying I'm mentally ill, oops, sorry, saying I'm mentally ill and I'm taking it out on the relationship, felt so confused, felt like my brain was melting. Mm. I've had my ex-partner tell me things like, I never said that, I wouldn't have acted this way if you had not made me mad, you're too sensitive. Yeah. Um, Another one said, I have stacks of journals from the past 26 years because the experience of not having a witness to these things and the desperation of not being able to communicate it with others, such hell. Oh boy. And then I like what you said about subconscious and habitual. Um, another comment says, I actually saw him on the TV being interviewed and oops, oops, oops. Sorry. There's a lot coming in. It's great. And I, and he said, quote, I wasn't there. That wasn't me. Oh, boy. Yeah. And then um, telling me that I am too emotional to have a conversation. Um, I can identify with the rewriting of history, but struggle with the intentionality of it. Like, is he really being intentional? I struggle with the cruelty of that intentionality. Um, another one says, OMG, so much like this person's comments you have been sharing. Um, this person's partner utilized gaslighting in so many dimensions, denied saying something, we made plans and he'd deny we ever discussed them, told me I must be hearing things and rewrote history. Mm -hmm. um, the greatest gaslighting was convincing me I was the problem. All I was doing was trying to understand what was wrong. Um, we have quite a few coming in and I'll just I'll keep reading them just for maybe another minute or two and then we can... Um, take a pause. Um, a lot of people saying they journal. Yes, I journal everything, note everything. Journals help me see how crazy it was. Um, yeah. Someone saying they're a step parent for the step parent for 38 years, micro aggressive jabs, but says I can't take a joke. Mm -hmm. um, my mother, and she is still doing it. She is also trying to convince my son and boyfriend that I lie and have mental issues. It hides in humor. We're hearing that a lot actually right now in the chat. Yeah. It hides like it hides in humor. Like I don't speak, I don't speak sullen teenager when my teen was not being sullen. Um, I say that again. So the it says it hides in humor, like, and then this is in quotes. I don't speak sullen teenager end quote when my teen was being sullen. Mm. So like a kind of sarcastic, you know, joke, a humor. Um, the too emotional label this another another person can completely identify with. Um, I experienced many moments of gaslighting and decided to record things in journals and notes to remember the moments. Always placing the blame, never taking responsibility for their actions, stating I'm the crazy one. And then Annette, we have a question. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go back to it. I actually have two questions. One is, is it gaslighting when clinician use rewrite endings of traumatic events to increase positive emotions and or to change negative memories or thoughts um this is done in a clinical environment uh yeah i don't i don't agree with that yeah is that in line with toxic positivity which we sometimes talk yeah mm-hmm and, and then toxic positivity is you know when you just uh when somebody else dismisses the severity of your experience and it's, it's almost like a Pollyanna approach. So they just turn it into a positive, even though there's nothing positive about this toxic situation. So it's called um, toxic positivity. And then the next question, um, it's amazing. So I just wanna say this real quick. We have so much coming into the chat still. I'm going to read this last question and we're going to get back to um, today's topic, but we're going to yeah. save all this because we want to address everything. We really appreciate the engagement. As Absolutely. you can see, it does, like Annette said, it does really help everyone here know they're not alone. Mm -hmm. um, so here's the question that I recently told my husband, he gaslights me and he, and he went and did his own research on emotional abuse and realized that there were many abusive measures he used in our relationship. He says he will change and wants to work on himself to be better for himself, us, and our children. 
How do I know he isn't tricking me as a tactic to keep me to stay in the marriage? Well, I think it's just really important to know that a person who is engaging in gaslighting has an entirely different world view about how relationships should function. So for example, you're an empathic person, you're kind, you care, and you're nurturing, you care about each person in your family, you want the best for everyone. It's not like you want the best just for yourself, but somebody who practices gaslighting and emotional abuse, they are, <clears throat> the way they view the world and they think, <clears throat> pardon, they think that everybody thinks like they do is to preserve oneself. Um, they think every, at least it's usually um, men that are, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's usually men who are the abusers, but we know that men are also abused as well. But so I'm going to say that um, what is very common is that, that a lot of abusive men think that other men in marriages think the way they do about the role that their uh, spouse is supposed to play, which is to serve <clears throat> their needs. And so um, it's deeply entrenched. And those kinds of issues don't get resolved because somebody just says, I want to change. They need to be enrolled in an intensive therapeutic program for at least a couple of years before you're going to really see, um, or at least a year before you're going to see change that is genuine. Um, otherwise it's, I would say it's more of a ploy, um, because they don't even know what they need to do to change. Um, and we talk a lot about the four pillars of abuse, the mindset that makes up an abuser, which is, um, entitlement so they feel entitled it's deeply entrenched in them they have a faulty belief system meaning that they believe they're in a hierarchical position and that they are entitled to dominate they care about image management how they look to others which is very different from how they're actually acting behind closed doors and they have a lower emotional iq so they're very uncomfortable with emotions yours and theirs, um, and, and they, uh, they don't know how, they're not in touch with their emotions. They've never had their emotional IQ developed. So you're dealing with somebody who's an entirely different playbook than what an empathic person would be communicating from. And those changes are very difficult um, to make happen. And it takes a lot of hard work for an extended period of time with an expert therapist who understands narcissistic behaviors or abusive behaviors. So um, if your spouse hasn't rushed out and bought books and is learning everything they can and reading and consuming everything they can about how to change and showing you all kinds of proactive measures to make that happen, reaching out, trying to find the best therapist. If they're not doing those things, I would say it's just a line to keep you engaged. I want to go back to one other comment that somebody said that they were struggling with the intentionality of gaslighting, that it just seems hard to believe that somebody would intentionally do those things. And um, I want to tell you something that um, many years ago when I was in an abusive marriage, um, one thing that my husband said to me at the time, um, it was such a dumb argument, but it went on for two days, um, mostly because I stayed engaged and I wanted to address exactly what he was saying and overcome it and say, that's not what we were talking about. This is what we're talking about. And, you know, um, he would use all these uh, gaslighting and justifications and things to take me off deflections to take me off course of that conversation. And I remember that on the second day, when we revisited the argument, um, I said, wait a minute, the arguments you're making to me right now are exactly counter to the arguments that you made the day before. So you're contradicting yourself. 
And he said, you found me out. That's what I do. And it just gave me a chill up my spine to see that it was very intentional. He wants to win an argument. And that's what most abusers want to do. They want to win the argument. They don't think of, let me find a solution where we both feel like we're winning, where the family's winning, where the marriage is winning. They want to win. And so they do this, anything that they can to avoid taking responsibility for something. They just want to power over and win. And so maybe that'll put it into a different context for you. Okay, so moving on, gaslighting can occur in various contexts, but it's particularly prevalent in relationships with power imbalances. A handful of common scenarios where gaslighting occurs, um, where there's this kind of power imbalance would be things like intimate relationships. In intimate relationships, a manipulative partner may use gaslighting to undermine their partner's confidence and isolate them. They may constantly criticize their partner, not always, but some are criticizers. Um, they criticize their partner's actions and decisions, leading the victim to doubt their sanity. Or they just counter, I don't mean just, they counter the victim's perspective um, in this constant effort to undermine the victim and to be the person in the dominant position. It happens in parent-child relationships where parents or caregivers who are abusive may resort to gaslighting to control and manipulate their children. They may belittle the child's feelings and emotions, or they'll shut their emotions down and they won't even allow the child to really express their emotions, making the child feel guilty and inadequate and making the child feel that they themselves can't trust their own perceptions um, because that dependence develops. And it's really harmful um, when a parent does this to a child, especially because they're in the developmental stages of life where their brain is developing and it has far reaching impact. It happens in the workplace with hierarchical structures um, in those environments. It can be a breeding ground for gaslighting. A manipulative coworker or boss may use gaslighting tactics to belittle others and maintain control over them. One person came to me, they were so confused um, because there, there was a team of coworkers who were working on a project and the, the supervisor was sabotaging this one person and they were having such a hard time um, pinpointing how they were doing that. But one thing they identified was that um, the group emails would sometimes include this person and sometimes it would omit this person when they would uh, make, you know, uh, give out assignments for, for the team. And so this cowork, this one coworker I was speaking to didn't get the assignment because it was deliberately left off the group email. And, and this confused the whole team because they didn't recognize that that person wasn't on the email. And so this person was underperforming on these tasks because they weren't informed. Um, it can happen in, I'm moving on to another, it can happen in racial and political gaslighting. So gaslighting occurs on a societal level um, in the form of racial um, discrimination um, or, or certain groups or individuals will manipulate information to discredit or undermine others based on political biases or race or ethnicity. Um, it happens in institutions where institutional gaslighting um, would be in an organization where those in power manipulate information or situations to foster a culture that's a culture of denial um, and blame shifting or mislead investors and or the general public. Um, then we have narcissistic gaslighting. It's one of the more severe forms of abuse secretly employed to distort a person's perception of reality. This insidious form of manipulation leaves victims questioning their sanity, uh, their memories, and even their identity as a person. They start to lose a sense of who they actually are. It's a power plane 
play designed to gain control over another person, often used by narcissists, soci sociopaths, and abusive partners. And gaslighting is often a systemic and calculated act involving various tactics to ensure the victim's subjugation. Some of the common tactics include countering, which I briefly mentioned, and in countering, so the victim raises a concern and possibly makes a request. Um, and the gaslighter in response does not comply, but does the opposite. So they might say, if, if you say, I want my, um, I want you to buckle the car seat this way because you're not doing it thorough enough and I'm afraid it's not safe. And they say, okay, fine, fine, fine. But they, they go back and they just continue doing what they're doing. So they said, yes, fine, they'll comply, but they do the opposite. And sometimes they don't say, okay, yeah, I'll do it and still do the opposite. They just do the opposite. You know, if you say, I prefer to have fish every Friday and they're the chef in the house and then they do the opposite and, you know, don't accommodate you when um, we're allowed to have preferences and most healthy couples will compromise and um, respect those preferences. And a, a, a narcissist who's countering or an abuser who's countering cannot tolerate having you make a decision. They need to power over, they need to be in control. So it's absolutely a flick of a switch for them to do the opposite of what you are requesting. Um, another form is withholding. The perpetrator um, refuses to listen to the victim's concerns. They may refuse to communicate um, as a form of punishment, like the silent treatment for hours or days or even weeks at a time, or pretends not to understand what the victim wants. So it's like faux confusion, like they're really not confused, but they just pretend. So it gets them out of being held accountable accountable to actually meeting the need that the victim is um, setting for. Uh, they may use trivializing where the gaslight got lighter belittles the victim's feelings or emotions, making them feel that their concerns are unimportant. Um, and then there's denial where the gaslighter denies their actions to the victim and sometimes even to themselves. Um, or blames their behavior on others refusing to take responsibility. And there's this, an, an acronym that goes along with denial. Don't even know I'm a liar. So it's so habitual that it's just their go-to position. Um, and you know, deception is at the root of denial. And then there's deflections. Instead of addressing the issue at hand, that is laid out clearly for them, the gaslighter brings up another topic to divert the focus off themselves and instead directs the blame onto the victim. So it's a way to quickly put the victim on the hot seat um, and suddenly the victim is this hijacked because now they're having to defend themselves for something that had nothing to do with what they were trying to get resolved in the first place. Then there's stereotyping where the gaslighter uses negative stereotypes related to gender, which is very common in abusive relationships, race or ethnicity, which is also very common to undermine the victim. So if you have a different ethnicity than your spouse, they'll say things to put down um, your ethnic background. Or if you are um, a woman, victim. This often happens where there's derogatory, sarcastic remarks made about women in general and where they put you in that category. And then another method that they use is rewriting history where the gaslighter says, I never said that, or we never discussed that, or you told me something you didn't tell them when you never said what they're proclaiming. Um, that's super common um, to have history rewriting, which is often why we pull out our journals and document um, what actually occurred. Abusive gaslighting is a form of cognitive manipulation designed to change the thinking and behavioral patterns of the other individual. 
with abusive gaslighting if you pay, pay, pay close attention or document your conversations, you'll be able to identify a pattern or a consistency of specific gaslighting behaviors. And we just went through a number of them. Um, so it's, um, excuse me, I'm gonna have another sip. When you're journaling, which I fully uh, uh, agree with you doing, and I even encourage you to record conversations, um, when you journal, you don't just want to say, he said this, I said that. Yes, those are important. But it's also important to look at the behavioral, the, like I just gave you a list of terms and definitions. Um, and we have a list of terms and definitions on our website that you can download um, in PDF form for free. It's important to look at those terms like withholding and um, blame shifting um, and deflection and denial, those things, so that you can actually write down the patterns that you're seeing, because that will then uh, really help prepare you for what's to come, because the best precursor for what's to come is past history. And so naming those specific abusive behaviors within the gaslighting family of behaviors can really help to um, empower you, bring you clarity and help you advocate for yourself because you'll have the proper language to attach to these confusing manipulative behaviors. So how can a victim or responder detect gaslighting? Um, Identifying gaslighting can be really challenging. However, certain signs can indicate the presence of gaslighting in a relationship. So there are signs. And the first is consistent lying. <clears throat> the perpetrator often tells blatant lies or they omit um, information or they speak in half truths to create a precedent of dishonesty, but to confuse you you know, keeping the victim in the dark or making it difficult for the victim to discern truth from falsehood. It's very, when somebody tells a half truth, um, it can be just a sprinkling of truth masked by a lot of distorted information. And it's, it's traumatizing because let's say you're in a therapeutic office and this is employed against you where there's a half truth suddenly you're having to explain what the real situation is, but it's so hard because part of what they said is true, but it's not the true meaning of the overall situation. And so you're just working extra hard to overcome their deception and to provide accuracy. And it's a, an effective tool that abusers use to hijack a therapeutic session so they can keep the focus off of their behavior and make the victim work harder. Another sign is broken promises where the gaslighter makes a promise to change a certain behavior, but never follows through, or they say, I forgot. The victim assumes the gaslighter for, um, forgot when all along it was a ploy to continue doing what they want, regardless of the negative impact on the victim. They didn't forget. They just selective have selective memory they didn't want to remember um they didn't want to do it so they just claim they forgot um and a lot of therapists miss this um they miss broken promises um because they think oh people do forget and they don't see the patterns if forgetting is a pattern um you can absolutely name it for what it is. I'm sorry for my notifications. I don't know how to shut that off. I'm gonna to have to figure that out before our next workshop. The next thing to look for is denial of evident facts. Even when confronted with concrete evidence, the gaslighter denies their actions or statements to further distort the victim's perception of reality. Sometimes the gaslighter will say, well, I lied because I never wanted to agree to it in the first place, or, you confront them about something hurtful they say to you and they may respond by saying that never ha happened or you're always making things up or your ears are playing tricks on you. Um, 
although you would swear it really happened the way you remember the gaslighter's confident refusal plants seeds of self-doubt and confusion in you. And you may wonder if you're the one who's forgetting things. Another sign is manipulative love and flattery. The gaslighter often uses flattery or shows affection to confuse the victim and mask their manipulative tactics. They may purchase you a gift to mask to mask deviant behaviors they planned without your knowledge and so forth. Um, and another sign of gaslighting is that they protect their faults. Gaslighters often, I'm sorry, project their faults. A gaslighter will often project. So projection means if the gaslighter lies or if the gaslighter cheats, they'll accuse you of lying or cheating. So um, that's called projection. They're projecting onto you what they're actually doing themselves. And um, it's so confusing. Um, they may seem say things like, you're the one who always causes problems, or you're just as bad as I am. By projecting their negative traits onto the victim, the gaslighter manipulates them into believing that they are the, that the victim is the one at fault or tries to confuse the victim to make them feel guilty when they've done nothing to feel guilty about. And it's very effective. And then there's isolation from others. Gaslighters through isolation um, is a big red flag. Either the victim voluntarily isolates themselves from others because um, she is stressed, confused, depressed, or ashamed of the conflict in the relationship, or the gaslighter may deliberately, um, through coercive control, isolate the victim by pressuring them to have limited contact with their family of origin or, or social support structure or others, um, making the victim more dependent on the gaslighter's perceptions and opinions. Essentially, if you notice one or more of these signs, usually it's many of these are employed at once, um, Gaslighting is happening um, and you need to take note that this is going to seriously compromise your mental well-being if you aren't able to identify it, um, name it, confront it, or remove yourself um, through maybe um, a marital separation um, where you can give yourself some space and time to heal and to collect your thoughts and and secure your identity and perceptions and feel confident again in yourself where you can trust your gut um, because your gut intuition has now been so manipulated that you don't really trust your own perceptions. And so it's really important to try to get some space, maybe move into a different bedroom, um, whatever it takes to limit your contact with the gaslighter. You don't want to engage in gaslighting conversations, you want to just back away from it and um, recognize you're not going to step into crazy making as you help yourself get stronger. That's really what you need to be doing is getting stronger, more confident in your perspective and so forth. Um, okay, I lost my notes. Um, Okay, I'm gonna give you a few other examples of gaslighting. Uh, <clears throat> invalidating your feelings and experiences by saying things like, you're overreacting or you're too sensitive. By responding this way, they effectively are dismissing or belittling the victim's emotions, feelings, and beliefs about any given topic. So they just, with it, they just invalidate it. They take it away. They make it into nothing. They make it powerless. Another method is blame shifting. They may say things like, you're the one causing all the problems, or you're the reason I acted that way. Um, or by doing this, the gaslighter manipulates the victim into believing that the victim is at fault for the abuser's behavior. And the victim's self-blame, because we've been so beaten down, that now we start to blame, we have a lot of self-doubt and we may blame ourselves. This actually protects the abuser's image and makes the victim bear the brunt of the consequences. And I see this play out a lot when law enforcement has been called or in a therapeutic session where 
the victim who's an empathic person is very willing to accept fault for their part in a situation. Sometimes to a fault, they are taking on more responsibility um, to be blamed than what's even appropriate because there is this, after being gaslit so much, you get this cognitive dissonance, which means there is reality happening, but cognitively you don't see reality. So you take on a greater part of the blame. And then that, when you're willing to confess um, for things that maybe you shouldn't even be confessing for, uh, then law enforcement may blame you as being the abuser. And in a therapeutic office, it really confuses the therapist when you're saying, well, yes, sometimes I can yell. And sometimes, you know, I, it's, I'm the one that got all worked up. It, it confuses the therapist because it's really not the important topic to be discussed. What's important is what led up to the conflict? What, what led up to it? And then what patterns of behavior, what manipulative, what destructive behaviors were employed in the conversation? Um, and so to stay focused on the abuse um, as the main point. Another tactic is creating doubt by saying things like, are you sure you remember that correctly? I think you're imagining things. By planting seeds of doubt, the gaslighter makes the victim question their perception of reality again. And then gaslighting through manipulative apologies. It sounds like, I'm sorry you feel that way, or I apologize if you misunderstood me, or they may give you a partial apology. So they'll apologize for part of what they did, um, to change the victim's focus off the larger breach, breaches or the larger issue. So each of these phrases is not a genuine apology and it's intended to make the victim doubt their judgment and emotions. They're implying that the victim is overreacting or being oversensitive or the abuser is trying to make the victim forget the facts or become confused. Then there's gaslighting through manipulation. They may say things like, other people have it worse, or you're making a big deal out of nothing. By downplaying the victim's feelings and experience, the gaslighter invalidates their struggles and makes them feel guilty for expressing their needs. Then there's gaslighting through love and affection. Gaslighters often use expressions of love and affection as a way to manipulate their, their victims. So they may say things like, um, I'm only doing this because I care about you, or I love you too much to let you make that wrong decision. By framing their controlling and or abusive behavior as acts of love, the gaslighter confuses the victim and makes them question their judgment. So if you've noticed one or more of these things happening repeatedly in your relationship, you're definitely being gaslit. And if you're in an abusive relationship, I can guarantee you, that there are being methods used to gaslight you. And you may not have yet identified them because it causes so much confusion. Give yourself grace because it is confusing. It's such a mind game. And the more, the more that you can gain clarity, um, the more you will be able to begin to heal and get internal strength um, because clarity is the first step to healing. Okay, the impact that gaslighting can have on a person's mental and emotional well being is profound. Some experiences people have when they are being gaslight, gaslit include a loss of self identity. Gaslighting can distort one's self image, so the way you view yourself, and self confidence, leading to a loss of feeling secure in oneself. Um, or a complete loss of personal autonomy and identity. And so um, you start to take on think, feelings like maybe I'm unlovable, or maybe I don't know how to communicate effectively, or maybe um, something is intrinsically wrong with me. You start taking on, you lose your identity, you lose your footing, you lose your grounding, um, and you can't uh, combat uh, this situation. You can't overcome trauma 
until you can feel that you have a solid sense of identity where you really believe in yourself. You believe you're lovable. You believe you're a good person. You believe it's not your fault. Um, and you stop over-functioning um, to accommodate the abuser, but you spend time working on getting stronger, um, getting a clear perspective of things. Another thing it can cause in you is constant self-doubt, where the victim often second guesses themselves and questions their own judgments and memories because you're so disconnected from your true intuition because it's been so undermined, you don't feel confident um, that you're thinking about it clearly. Another experience that can happen is feeling invalidated. The gaslighter often dismisses the victim's feelings, making them feel invalidated, which we've talked about already. Um, and you will notice a lack of empathy from the abuser because the abuser is focused on powering over <clears throat> and winning all arguments. So you feel empty, you feel lonely, you feel <clears throat> like you don't have a place, a, a chair at the table. You don't have agency in the relationship. And then another experience that happens when you're being gas is isolation. The victim may feel disconnected from others and struggle with establishing trusting relationships. So much self-doubt and confusion and stress um, causes you to live in your head trying to sort everything out. And you tend to isolate because you don't feel um, healthy and confident and happy to be interacting with others. So you pull away, which is really harmful for you in the long run because what you really need is solid, safe, trustworthy friends that you can share um, your circumstances with <clears throat> so that you can receive validation and support. And then um, the last thing that I'm gonna talk about in terms of um, um, how it can affect you is increased anxiety and depression. Chronic gaslighting can lead to mental health issues. So please take this seriously. You need to protect yourself. Only you, you are your best advocate. Only you can do that. Your spouse is not going to do that for you. Um, they're not interested in that. They're interested in winning and empowering over. And even though they may have love for you, it's, they don't know how to love. It's very distorted. Um, and so you're gonna take on things like anxiety, and depression and um, maybe even post-traumatic stress disorder. Gaslighting, it's very common that victims will end up developing post-traumatic stress. Um, and so um, there's a lot of online tests that you can find to see if you feel that you have PTSD. Um, and I just really want you to take care of yourself and get the kind of help that you need to overcome trauma, because if you seek the right help um, and you're supported by a community of friends, you can overcome that in a sh relatively short period of time. But if you stay in a situation where you are continually re-traumatized, it's going to be very difficult for you to heal. And it's just going to make your post-traumatic stress even worse. So how can someone address the gaslighting once it is detected. Um, it requires strategic communication to, to assert your reality and to set boundaries. So here are some phrases that can help when responding to someone who's gaslighting you. You can say, um, I understand we have different perspectives, but this is how I see it. And you just state your case. And then you don't engage in their argument. You just keep repeating it. You, I don't share your perspective and you just hold your stance. Another thing is I hear how you're framing it. Mm -hmm. However, I disagree and I'm not imagining things and you just hold your ground. I hear how you're framing it, but I disagree and I'm not imagining things. And then you might, you might also try saying my feelings are valid and this is how I feel and you are ignoring and wrongly judging my feelings. It's very typical for abusers to judge 
their spouse's feelings rather than really listen to them and, and say, tell me more about that, honey. I want to understand what I did that caused you to feel hurt. You know, so I'm curious. I want to hear more. That's a healthy person. An abuser will shut down that person and will judge your emotions as though they're bad and a threat to them and attack to them. They interpret any feeling that is not um, exalting them, adoring them. Any feeling that is concerned, a complaint, a request, a hurt is considered an attack um, because they like I said, they have a low emotional IQ and they can't process your emotions. They can't assimilate your emotions with theirs and so forth. Another thing you can say is, I understand you're saying you didn't mean to hurt me, but I've communicated many times that those actions will cause me hurt. And you just own it and say it. So I understand you're saying you didn't mean to hurt me, but I've communicated many times that those actions will cause me hurt and you do it anyways. So that's something you can say. You can also say, I don't feel acknowledged or heard right now and I need a break from this discussion. I don't share your perspective. I don't feel acknowledged or heard right now. So I need a break from this discussion and I don't share your perspective. So you're not giving up anything, you're holding your ground. And while dealing with gaslighting can be overwhelming, and it really is, several strategies can help you navigate through this manipulative tactic. Um, give yourself space, both mentally and physically, from the gaslighter if you can. If you feel uncomfortable or unsafe, it's perfectly acceptable to walk away from the conversation or situation. Schedule mental breaks, and if helpful, write down negative talk that interrupts your rest in order to get it out so you can rest your brain. So if I call, I, I, um, I can't remember what book this is, but um, they call them ants, automatic negative thoughts. And we can get into this cycle of ants um, when we're being gaslit. And so when you're resting, write down those thoughts, um, maybe write down an affirmation to counter them. Then you know it's on paper, you don't have to sit and perseverate over it. You can rest your brain and know that you've gotten it out and off your chest. Um, while you take space, practice using positive self-talk. Reach out to trusted friends or family. Sharing your experiences um, can actually provide you a reality check and much needed emotional support. And if who you confide in is not believing you and supporting you, don't work too hard to try to convince them because that's actually a traumatizing exercise. Just say, okay, well, oh, I forgot. I lost track of the time I need to go. Exit the conversation and find somebody who will be supportive. You don't need to waste time on someone who is going to make you have to work extra hard to convince them of what you're sharing. Um, if you find a good person to confide in, they can help you see the situation from an outsider's perspective. If you're trusted, um, so in other words, they will, um, they will validate you. They will say nothing you did deserved to be treated that way. You're a good person. You deserve so much better. And I'm here with you on your journey. Um, they won't pressure you to stay or to leave. Um, that'll, they'll leave that completely up to you. They'll treat you as an equal. They won't try to tell you what to do. They'll just be there to support you. That's what you really need um, because it actually models for you what a healthy relationship looks like. That's what healthy is. It's not someone talking down to you and powering over you. It's somebody just accepting you where you are, whether you're where they think you should be or not. They accept where you are and they support you. Stop um, trying to win the disagreement. Um, I did that for years trying to like, I was telling you about the argument that went on for two days because I literally took everything you said and overcame those objections. Um, oh, so much work and exhausting. The reality is you will not win an argument about what really happened when you're dealing with a gaslighter. If you choose to engage, be cautious to not get caught up in their snare. Don't let them 
hijack the conversation. Stick to those core messages that I told you. Um, I don't share your perspective. Like hold your ground so you don't even have to step into the conversation. Often it's best to disengage and walk into another room. And it's important to know that when you, you talk to others, um, you don't have to prove your reality. Um, you can just state what actually occurred and they need to accept that. And if they don't, like I said, um, if you don't feel supported, uh, you just move on to somebody else. Don't put yourself in that kind of traumatic situation. Stand firm. Start to get familiar with your gut intuition again and trust your gut. It's, your gut is such a powerful tool for you. Um, and you may have to do some re-familiarizing yourself with your opinions, your beliefs, um, your attitudes about things um, to, so that you can know who you are, recreating your identity. I remember I was so lost. I just had to start reading the newspaper every day to figure out what opinion I had about things. Um, I, I just felt like I did. I was just drowning in a sea of water and I just didn't, couldn't get any solid footing. And I would read my Bible and I would just, I started rebuilding my core beliefs. If your instincts have been so compromised from ongoing gaslighting that you don't trust your perceptions, I want you to notice how your body feels. Do you feel frustrated? Do you feel stressed? Do you feel angry? Or maybe you feel hurt? Notice your body's reactions and trust what your body is telling you. Your feelings and emotions are valid and your body will tell you something's wrong. Um, you can trust yourself. Remain confident in your reality and version of the events. Um, just don't even allow yourself with their crazy making talk. I know it's important to journal, um, but I want you to get to a place where you can say, that's just BS. I know what the truth is. I don't even need to journal it because I'm confident that I am clear-minded. Um, that's a really strong person and you're not there yet and it will take quite some time. In the meantime, journaling helps you to get there. Um, so while you're journaling, keep a record of incidences. Documenting incidents Incidences of gaslighting can serve as a source of validation, like I mentioned, but um, as if you have a lot of self-doubt, it can really help you. Um, I'm okay, I'm running out of time. I can see because I'm looking at the clock. Um, you, you might journal your experiences or save text. I really highly encourage you to save text messages and emails. Um, in a special file so that they can't be erased by your spouse, particularly if you go through a separation or a divorce, um, you need that kind of proof um, because these things are very difficult to prove. And in many states, they don't recognize emotional abuse as a form of domestic violence. But when you can show text messages and the crazy making behaviors, it really gives you um, a leg up in this confusing situation um, because you will be falsely accused of things by your gaslighter that are not true and you need to be able to overcome that. Okay, so I want you to, I'm, I'm gonna just, I'm, I want you to seek professional help if you can. Therapists and counselors specifically trained in dealing with emotional abuse and trauma. Uh, their support groups, um, you don't need a therapist who minimizes your concerns or who looks for your faults or who treats your complaints as though it takes two to tango. Um, abuse is the only issue that needs to be discussed. Um, it's not a relational problem. It's abuse is a choice that the perpetrator is making. I would love for you to get to a place where you can establish and enforce firm boundaries. Setting clear boundaries can help protect you from further manipulation. And boundaries without consequences consequences attached are nothing more than complaints. So before you set a boundary and a consequence, really think about if you're willing to follow through on that consequence. 
If you're not strong enough to do that yet, then don't set the boundary. Um, you, you can make a request, but what you really need to be able to get to is a place where you're sit, stating what you will and will not accept and what will happen if they don't comply. And then you have the courage. It's a big burden to have to enforce a boundary. It's a lot of pressure. You, you start to feel like, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that or I shouldn't have said that. Or um, You have to be at a place where you're willing to follow through on the consequence. So if that means that you're going to ask the person to leave or you're going to leave, or maybe it's that you leave for a few days. I don't know. You know um, your own personal boundaries, um, but you have to be willing to follow through. Um, let me see. I'm skimming through because I'm so sorry I over-talked on certain things. Oh, prioritize self-care. Taking care of your physical, emotional, and mental health is crucial when dealing with gaslighting. Engage in activities that bring you joy and peace, even as hard as it may be when you're so depressed and full of anxiety. I promise you, if you step out, join an exercise class or an art class or knitting or whatever it is, your hobby, um, stepping out and meeting some new people in the community and having a creative outlet or an outlet for exercise to increase your endorphins, it will positively impact you in significant ways. And so force yourself, you might even wanna get an accountability partner, someone who will say, what new things have you tried this week? And really encourage that. Take good care of yourself, take hot baths, read books, um, go on walks, um, go into nature, do things that really res respect yourself. Um, also, I encourage you to call the National Domestic Violence Hotline. They offer 24 seven support through phone calls, live chats, and text messages, you can reach them at 1-800-799-7233, or you can text START in all capital letters to 88788. Gaslighting can leave deep psychological scars, so it's so important that you recognize what is happening and that you gain that clarity. Um, and take good care of yourself. So now um, I know we're over time, but I'll stay on. If anybody has any questions they'd like to ask me, I'm sorry I went so long um, for those of you who have to leave, but you can always um, go to the recording and fast forward it to the Q&A section if you'd like to hear the questions and answers if you're not able to stay on. So thank you. Really good. Okay, we do have a number. Well, first I wanna say Annette, um, there are a number of people here who actually are responders. We have a couple of therapists. Um, we might have more than that, um, but I wanted to just acknowledge that they have really thanked you for the work you're doing. Um, uh -huh. that as a therapist, your resources have been so valuable. And um, some people who are here who typically couldn't be here are able to be here because of the quality of the the educational resource and the teaching and the training. They um, have been here with us almost every workshop as far yeah, as I think. That's wonderful. It's so nice to have you. And thank you to the therapists that have um, offered an affirmation. It makes me feel like it's all worth it. So thank you. Yes, absolutely. So I wanted to make sure to communicate that right off the bat. We do have some questions and um, I'm going to take the first one. We have like a number of um, um, different themes that are happening. So the first one I'm going to share with you is from someone who's here, who's experiencing gaslighting in the workplace and has mm -hmm. noted how family and friends can actually um, gaslight as well when seeking help. And um, this person noted that therapists often don't know how to examine relationships. So to the point that therapists are here learning, they are here learning and they know that they need this education. But this says therapists often don't know how to examine relationships between the lines and they can take the client literally and see the victim's behavior as self-generated. Um, this person was asking, I'm going to go back to the start because they started with a question. Can you talk about how gaslighting plays out in organizations? So this person is experiencing it in the workplace and noted that it's really difficult 
to uh, make an EEOC case for a gaslighting workplace, um, it's and it's exceptionally traumatizing to do so. So, I yeah, wonder- it's really traumatizing. Okay, so if it's going on in the workplace, I did talk about a couple examples, like the person who was periodically eliminated from group um, emails, um, or another thing is that. Um, you do all this work and then your direct supervisor takes the credit for the work. But if anything goes, if, if a project goes badly, then you take all the blame. <clears throat> There's so many different ways that gaslighting can play out. Um, if you tr- truly want to bring a case um, against the company, um, I would, I would uh, find an attorney. I, first off, I would be gathering documentation on um, whatever document. It's so hard to document, but you can also, you know, journal or type out uh, a scenario. I wouldn't do it on um, on your company com- computer unless you know that it's secure. Um, but I would type out what actually happened and keep a record of it. Just have start a file of all these scenarios that are playing out and um, then seek the advice of an attorney and see if they feel that they can defend you. I wouldn't necessarily, I mean, a a consultation is often free or it is um, lower cost than the attorney's regular rate. Sometimes they'll take these cases on contingency, um, but I also want you to consider just leaving this job um, and finding other employment because regardless of how good the situation is for you, it is so bad for your mental health that I really want you to take care of yourself. And I know that might be not what you want to hear right now, but um, there are positive work cultures out there. And there's a lot of surveys that are done in various industries where um, they survey employees anonymously to see how they rate their own culture. And so you can actually do some research and find companies with a positive work culture that you can then strive for. At least you might not be able to make an immediate switch, but you can start applying and pursuing those um, on the side. So I just want to throw that out there too. Thank you for that question. Jill, are you there? I'm sorry. I accidentally muted myself. Can you hear me? I can now. Okay. Oh, good. Because there's so much more good that's here. Um, So speaking of therapists, we actually have people in the chat saying, I am a therapist and I experienced psychological abuse. We have people who are asking Annette, and maybe you want to address this real quick because we do have a number of other questions. Do you have any rec- um, recommendations for therapists? It's been really discouraging for people to try to find a solid therapist. Um, I like, uh, I have, if you write to us at info at themendproject.com, um, I can give you some names, but just right off the bat, um, I really like the therapists at the Marriage Recovery Center. Um, They're outside of Seattle, but they do online um, therapeutic work and they deal almost 100% with abusers and narcissists and the victims they harm. So they really understand this stuff. You don't have to over explain yourself. They just understand the language. They'll actually give you language, which um, I like. pardon me, Jonathan Glover is really good. And um, John Hudson, um, Dr. David Hawkins, Charmin Kimbrough, just to give you a few names there. Thank you, Annette. Yeah. We have a couple, well, I kind of giggled at this one. It says, um, thank you so much for today. My hand is sore from writing so much. Oh gosh. Go back to the recording. (laughs) Yes. Yes. So thank you for saying that, Annette, because there were a few questions about like, oh no, that was really fast. I missed some of it. 
this is all going to be on the recording sent to you and it will be housed on our YouTube channel. We have another thank you so much for your work. I know this. I'm sorry that I had to speak so fast. We had so much to cover today. Yeah, it's a big topic for sure. Um, another comment. Thank you so much for your work from the bottom of my heart. You're making such a difference in the world and making it a better and safe place. Um, oh, thank you for saying that. That really motivates me to keep doing this. So thank you. Yes. Um, real quick, I'm going to hop to the rest of the questions. Um, someone who is asking you to define the difference between brainwashing and gaslighting. Um, and this is from someone who's been married for 45 years and going through divorce. Gosh, I would have to Google the technical definition of brainwashing, but um, I think that brainwashing just off the top of my head comes from almost being in a captive situation, which can be in some cases in domestic violence, but um, like, let's just look at Patty Hearst and what happened to her. She was held captive. And then, so first her captains are villains, and then they slowly start meeting her needs and persuading her. And she's isolated from the rest of the world. So they're sharing their perspective and um, convincing her of their plight and what they're trying to accomplish. And then she goes out and actually participates with them in it later. Um, I think that's a good example of brainwashing. And I think um, like with POWs and people who are in captivity, that would be more brainwashing. But the overall effect of gaslighting feels like brainwashing because it can completely alter your perspectives, like I said, and cause you to lose your identity. So that, that's my take on it, but I'm not looking at the dictionary. Um, okay, so I'm going to keep reading through here. We're, we're getting a number of questions, so I just kind of let you know we do have quite a few left, Annette, okay. um, and we are going to stay on. So um, is it okay to say, quote, that's a lie when the lie is cloaked in a joke? For example, my husband threw away our kids' tadpoles and mini trampoline while we were out of town. When they expressed disappointment, he said things like, the, tadpole, the tadpoles graduated to a better home. And I threw the trampoline like a Frisbee into the field and it turned into a garbage dumpster. My 10 year old autistic daughter said angrily, you're joking, I don't like this joke. But it didn't occur to me at the time to call out the lie for what it was. So yeah, that's a lie. And I would, I would have called it out. I, um, I know we're supposed to stand with our spouse, but a blatant lie is going to cause the kids to have those feelings of being gaslit. And I would advocate for my child. And um, that's just who I would be. I would, I would, I would confront, I might try confronting my spouse quietly first and seeing if they'll remedy the situation, give them that opportunity. But if they don't, then I'm going to side with the mental health of my child and I'm going to confront it. I would, I would, I would confront it with my spouse in the presence of my kids. And I know some people will disagree with that, but I just think it's so important that we help our kids feel secure and safe emotionally and help them develop an emotional IQ um, that gaslighting undermines or that lying undermines. Mm -hmm. Really good. Um, before the next question, um, we I want to let you know, Annette, we have a number of people here who just hopped on, one from India, one from Africa, one from New Zealand. So welcome. And yes, oh, that's fantastic. Welcome. Yeah, it's so fun, right? So yeah. we, we love that. And you will get a recording of this. So if you've missed it, not to worry, you'll get the recording and you can catch the talk, but we're glad you're here for the Q&A. Um, the next question, Annette, is what kind of mother would eventually tell a child growing up that she didn't want me? She wasn't ready yet. She only got pregnant because my dad was ready because all his friends were having kids. Then also she brought me to a psychiatrist when I was two. She claimed she told the doctor that she was going to kill me or herself because I didn't sleep at night. I was a little 
um, B word that wanted to sleep all day and stay up all night and she couldn't take it anymore. I am now in my 50s. My parents were physically, emotionally, and verbally abusive my entire life. I realized after she lied to my son and told him the psychi- told him that the psychiatrist said I was crazy at two, something my son should never have even been told about. I have seen she is toxic and started isolating us from her. Since doing this, now my family wants to have me committed. They want control of my child and my life. I am at a loss. Oh boy. Um, first off, I'm just so sorry um, that you've felt or ought, have been abused and emotionally, physically, and all of that for your entire life. You're an adult now though, and you can make choices. And I would absolutely um, fight for your autonomy and fight for your, your child's um, I don't have enough of the story to know, like, is your husband against you? Is it adult kids? I mean, I, I don't know. Is it extended family? If it's extended family, you have every right to cut them off to protect you and your child. You know, our true family are the people who love us and support us. And that's who I would recommend that you surround yourself with and just limit contact with anybody who is that toxic and I wouldn't give them any power um they're wanting to have you committed I would I mean for somebody to be committed they have to be completely out of sorts I would work on grounding techniques to make sure that you don't have like an overreaction um even though the reaction is warranted um I would try to be really collected and calm and to really have your thoughts, you know, maybe write things down as to what you're going to say and do so that you're not yelling or crying or showing a lot of emotion when you're dealing with predatory people like that. I would be, um, and if you have to face law enforcement, if they call the police and try to have you admitted on a 5250 or something like that, I would um, just have something written down that you start to just really memorize and be able to, um, I mean, not anything long, but just a page at the most um, and just be able to defend yourself and to stay really secure and to focus on their maltreatment of you um, and not defending yourself necessarily, but focus on what led up to this. Um, their maltreatment. I I just don't have enough information to give you any more than that, but I'm just so sorry. And maybe getting some good therapeutic help would be really good for you too. Someone who's really on your side, who can speak into you. Oh, good. And so helpful in that. Such a hard situation. Yeah. Um, we have a couple more questions that I see for sure here. Um, And this question says, how do you navigate a therapy session where the therapist has been gaslighted before, beforehand, and now you've been minimized and invalidated even before your first session? How do you recognize it when it's happening in a session? Um, So I'm assuming that- The therapist, Annette. Pardon me? I think this might be a therapist. Yes, I think so. So how do you navigate a therapy session where the therapist has been gaslighted beforehand? Oh, never mind. And now you've been minimized and invalidated even before your first session. How do you recognize it when it's happening in a session? So is this a therapist or? It sounds like it's it sounds like it's from the client perspective. Because- okay. So from a client perspective, um, if your abuser has spoken to a therapist first, I would just approach your first therapeutic session um, um, I, I like this method where you write down on a piece of paper before you go to therapy, 
maybe one or two pages at the most, what it's like to live with your partner, the good, the bad, the ugly, and just outline what you can. Go to our website, use our terms and definitions, because that will give you the proper language to describe the behaviors that you're experiencing. I would print the terms and definitions, bring them with you, and even maybe bring your computer so that you can show them our website. Because when they see that there is an organization that is speaking about this correctly, it is credibility that you're bringing to yourself. It's part of your own advocacy. And so you can say, I realize that you spoke to my spouse, but he distorts the truth. He's a covert, emotionally abusive person. And I decided this is what I'd like to start off is to tell you what it's like to live with my spouse. And you read the letter and you show them the terms and definitions and you point out the kinds of behaviors that you're dealing with and then say what I really need is to get stronger. I've been gaslit so much. I need your help to help me believe in myself, to um, trust my gut, to find my intuition again, to find my identity, to get stronger. Um, I don't need you to find, um, to treat this as a mutual problem because abuse is a choice. It's not a relationship problem. It is one person treating another person in this way and I need to get stronger. And if you cannot do that for me, um, then I'm going to have a separate therapist than my spouse, which by the way, this is an opportunity to say that couples therapy is not recommended. It's actually contraindicated whenever any form of abuse is present. And a lot of therapists don't know this because it's not a board mandate. It's just what experts in the field recognize, and they all operate from that position. The ones that are really good and understand abuse and trauma, um, they would never counsel both the perpetrator and the victim. Um, what they would do is, if they're counseling the perpetrator, they would require the perpetrator to sign a waiver to allow the victim to speak into their therapy and say, you know, I, I remember when I went through therapy with um, my husband, uh, I would send an email each week and say, this is my version of what took place. Um, and just in a paragraph, um, this, this is my version and this is how I feel about their response. This is how they responded. Um, and then that way they can be confronted directly in real time on those events um, instead of accumulating all kinds of issues over months at a time and nothing gets resolved. But I, I'm not going to sit in a therapeutic session where they're trying to place any blame on the victim because if they say, well, you're 20% responsible, the abuser is going to look at that 20% as though it's 100% of the problem. It's not where the focus needs to lie. The focus needs to lie on identifying and clarifying abuse, confronting that abuse, and helping you get stronger so that you have more resilience. I hope that answers it. Really good. And yes, this person really liked your response and said being proactive uh, is a really but that was really helpful for this person. Mm -hmm. I really like that. Um, so I'm going to share one last question, Annette. And a couple of people have said something similar, trying to determine whether they're gaslighting or they're being gaslit and how confusing it can be. Um, and I addressed it earlier. I actually responded to the person who said this, but we just got a question again a little bit ago. And so I do want to share this um, question with you and have you address it. Okay. Um, so what if you are the one doing most of your own self gaslighting? It took me a week of going around in circles before I realized concretely that it was not okay for him to throw away those things without asking about it. He just gave off the don't say anything vibe and I unconsciously did the rest. At the end of the line, he's telling me 
my fear of saying anything is due to an imaginary monster under the bed that I need in order to justify the existence of that fear in the first place. So um, the question is, what if you are the one doing most of your own self gaslighting? Yeah, that's a great question because um, we, that's what gaslighting does. You end up participating in, and I, I mentioned that cognitive dissonance where there is reality and then there's the way you perceive that reality based on what your gaslighter created for you. And so you're gaslighting yourself because you're not looking at it really through an objective viewpoint. You're caught in the cycle of the gaslighting. Um, I would just say I would work really hard on gaining clarity, being able to name the behaviors that my spouse is employing against me, really gaining, really understanding the patterns of behavior that are being used on a regular basis. Um, I would, there's one book I'd like to recommend. It's called The Human Magnet Syndrome. I know I recommend it a lot, but for victims, I think it's a really good book to um, start to look at how you're over-functioning, how you're trying to do all the work for the relationship to hold everyone together, um, and how you are ignoring yourself, ignoring your gut, losing your identity, losing your intuition, um, and how you need to change your thinking and how um, you're actually um, attractive to the abuser because of how much you accommodate them. And you're just going to be stuck in this vicious cycle if you can't break free. And so that book will help give you an outline of the kinds of therapeutic steps that you need to take in order to really um, find yourself again and stop gaslighting yourself. And then Nett, to add to that, you say this often. And so I want to just um, drop this to the person, if you're questioning whether you're gaslit or you're being, or whether you're being gaslit or gaslighting um, the other person, the one who is abusing usually is not self-reflective and asking themselves that question. <laughs> That's such a good point. So automatically you're sitting there willing to look at your part your abuser is not willing to look at their part. So already you know that you are empathic. You are willing to self-reflect. You're willing to self-examine and make some changes. That's not the mindset of your abusive spouse. Uh, they are going to do anything to avoid taking responsibility, avoid being at fault. They just want to win. So they have very different motives for how they're treating this interpersonal relationship than you do. And so I want you to feel great about that, but also understand that the degree to which you're willing to be wrong and you're willing to work hard can also harm you because you need to be more, a little more self-protective. Um, and I mean, be open, but start to reevaluate. You don't need to take responsibility for things that your spouse did. And so um, starting to delineate where the line is um, on truth and falsehood. Um, it seems so simple, but when you've been gaslit, you lose sight of what truth is, just like you explained when he threw the items away and you walked around for a week thinking maybe that was okay. Um, that's very typical. And so it's just really working on gaining clarity as the first step and then working on gaining emotional strength and resilience and the ability to separate yourself from this person, whether that's, whether you choose to stay in the relationship, to stay well, while you maintain your autonomy and not engage in emotional conversations, don't expect them to meet your emotional needs. Um, it's a very um, parallel kind of living as opposed to interactive kind of living. 
Um, but some people choose that and then, or getting strong enough to actually leave the relationship. Um, those are basically your two options when you're dealing with someone who is likely not going to change unless they're willing to like go to the marriage recovery center that the place that I recommended where they put the men in groups for months at a time and do individual counseling and where you send an email that says this is what happened so they're confronted but I have to tell you that they recommend and so do I a marital separation first before you embark on counseling because for a couple of reasons you're going to continually be re-traumatized which is going to make your process of overcoming trauma and gaining clarity really challenging um, and you're going to be traumatized continually and also um, oftentimes abusers will not step into any change until there's a break until they experience some pain, until they lose something. Um, the, we often say there needs to be a breakdown before there can be a breakthrough. So a loss of a family or marriage um, temporarily or permanently can be a motivating factor. Um, something, you know, a real, that's why we say boundaries with consequences. So they actually feel the consequence of their actions that is more of a motivating factor um, for them and it's unfortunate that they it needs to be so strong but that's just how entrenched their thinking is thank you everyone and i hope that you'll join us again for our once a month workshops that we do bye-bye